All right, I'm so excited to read this. It's called The Path of a Packet Through the Linux Kernel. Here's the authors, and I'll zoom in so we can focus on one column at a time. Here's the abstract. Networking stacks are the backbone of communication and information exchange. This paper investigates the TCP IPv4 and UDP network stack of Linux, the most common server OS. We describe a trace of the most critical network functions of the Linux kernel 5.10.8. Although Linux networking code documentation exists, it is often outdated or only covers specific aspects like the IP or TCP layer. We address this holistically, covering a packet's egress and ingress path through the Linux networking stack. Moreover, we highlight intricacies of the implementation and pre present how the Linux kernel realizes networking protocols. Our paper can serve as a basis for performing optimizations, security analysis, network observability, or debugging. Nowadays, almost everything is networked from a personal computer to a fridge. Although networking is essential for modern computing, few know the complexity of getting a packet to and from a wire. Given the prevalence of Linux-based servers, it is common for packets to traverse through the Linux networking stack. However, understanding the intricacies of the complex packet processing within Linux takes time and effort. Nevertheless, this knowledge is often critical as it aids in a bunch of things. We base our investigation of the ingress and egress packet path on version 5.10.8 of the Linux kernel, and it is well documented, stable, and contains modern features such as just-in-time compiler for Berkeley packet filters. You might recognize it as BPF. Primarily, we make observations on the kernel source code, which we think, which we link to referenced kernel symbols. Although Linux kernel networking is becoming more diverse, for example, with the addition of multipath TCP, most traffic utilizes the standard TCP and UDP protocol stack. Moreover, despite the acceleration of IPv6 adoption, most devices still communicate over IPv4. Hence, we limit this analysis to TCP IPv4 and UDP IPv4. The remainder of the paper has the following structure. First, we compare this paper with existing literature. We explain the design of general Linux networking stack in the SKBuff data structure. We inspect the intricacies of both ingress and egress. And finally, we briefly summarize the most important findings. Related work, we evaluated literature on the Linux network stack to the best of our knowledge. While doing so, we made the following observations. Outdated kernel versions, more elaborate papers emerged in the 2000s using Linux kernel version two or three, although the implementation of older protocols in the network stack is stable. Much time has passed. Therefore, we investigated possible deviations. Then there's fragment information. Many papers focus on specific layers, most commonly the TCP and IP implementation, so others determine the cause of networking overhead. A holistic view is lacking in those papers. In particular, even when authors describe the path of a packet throughout multiple layers, they omit UDP, in contrast to this paper. Although there is a talk covering the whole ingress-egress path of Linux version 5, it is a high level, mainly giving an intuition. Hence, we aim for a middle ground between detailed layer-specific information and high-level network stack tracing. And so sometimes the translation might be a little um, strange, to me at least, because I am not from Germany. We assume a basic familiarity with Linux and networking. However, we briefly dis describe essential networking concepts relevant. Here's a networking stack. You got your socket, TCP or UDP, then IPv4, Ethernet, and network card. This is standard from user space to the wire. As shown, a socket either passes a packet to the user space application or receives a packet from the implementation of the transport layer protocol, that is TCP or UDP. The IP layer then routes the packets to the network layer. Below this layer, Linux allows filtering. I have, I have quite a few videos on IP tables. So filtering traffic via firewall rules, the network interface card forwards the packets that it receives from the receive buffer to the kernel and transmits packets read from the transmit buffer. Oh, and you can see that with the command ss-tnp, or at least you can see if there is data in either the send or receive buffers, or I think they're called send and receive queues. I don't know, maybe somebody watching this can tell me if it's the same thing as this buffer they're talking about here. The kernel saves packets in C structures called sk underscore buff, 
um, almost all functions along the packet path interact with it. It tracks packet metadata and maintains a start and end pointer to packet data in memory. Using references to packet data allows for efficient packet modification by adjusting the pointers, for example, when stripping a header away. Furthermore, these structures can be shared efficiently between different processes using memory references. Consequently, cloning a packet is also efficient since only the metadata has to be copied. Assuming a only workload. We show this in figure 2. These properties of skbuff form the basis of efficient packet processing on Linux. All right, I'm not sure where to start here. So buff2 has data. Does it go like this and then go to tail? Maybe their words here will clarify. Figure 2. Two simplified skbuff structures point to different locations within the same packet buffer. Head marks the padded start of the buffer while tail points to the end of the actual packet data. Data points to the currently processed header. In the next column it gets prettier. TCP send message. We have direct memory access here. Dev Q X MIT is in transmit. And this kernel space here, different from user space. And then here's the driver for that NIC. So the application writes to the socket write queue, which either does a TCP send message or a UDP one, I assume, just not shown in the picture. IP Q X MIT to the IP layer. And then there's a Dev Q transmit to the Q disk, which gets sent to the driver to do something that returns it to uh, kernel space and in kernel memory. All the packets are getting stored here, it looks like, until uh, the NIC is ready to transmit them. Their description of it is egress path of a packet in case of TCP as described in section 4.1, adopted from. And then why does it say file descriptor? Oh, I jumped over way too soon. I still like the order we've gone in, so I'm just going to pick up reading from here. First we analyze the egress path, that is how Linux sends packets from a user space app to the NIC as shown in figure 3. See, it's fine that we looked at that. Essentially, the egress side constructs the protocol headers, uh, pushing them to skbuff structures, which it sends out. And we'll just jump back here for two seconds. You can pause if you want. So in terms of the socket layer, all starts with a socket that has an associated domain. For example, AF Unix. I forgot what A stands for, but it's something family. Ah, uh, address family. And this idea refers to a specific communication protocol used for interprocess communication, IPC, through Unix domain sockets. So IPC communication is different than network communication. These are very different sockets. So thus you see address family Unix versus address family INET, as they're saying here, which is for IPv4. I don't know what XDP is. Grok says it stands for Express Data Path, designed for high performance packet processing. Oh, and it allows users, space applications, to interact directly with network packets. Useful for applications that need to handle a large number of packets very quickly. All right, so we'll keep that in mind. A system call wrapper function like write or send to enables us to send data over the socket, for example, as provided by the GNU C library. In the context of this paper, we choose write file descriptor buffer length to avoid unnecessary complexity. Writing to a file descriptor is a prime example of the Unix philosophy, everything is a file, since a file descriptor abstracts the socket. And I think the way this works is, since everything's a file, when a file is opened, it has a file descriptor. When a socket is opened, it has a file descriptor. But when these things are closed or go away, the file descriptor does as well. And then that number is available to the operating system to use again for another file or socket. For sockets, write invokes the sock send message function. It obtains the socket struct sock from the file descriptor, what we started to read before. Zoom in a little bit more. They say the file descriptor is provided by the user space application. I think the file descriptor is provided by the kernel or the operating system. Anyways, generally sockets operate on socket control messages containing the processes, process ID, user ID, and group ID. Socks and message retrieves this control message from the task struct a Linux data structure that contains this information for the calling process. With this information, socks and message typically passes the packet through Linux security modules, for example, SE Linux, to filter traffic. 
Finally, it calls a corresponding transport layer handler, in our case TCP or UDP via the macro indirect call INET. And the macro autonomously chooses a corresponding IPv4 or IPv6 variant of the transport protocol entry function, depending on the protocol specified in SKPROT, which is a field of the SKBuff. Now, transport layer. Here we arrive at the IPv4 related entry functions, TCP send message and UDP. So TCP first waits for the TCP connection establishment. You could use those commands I said earlier to see what connections have been established. Then it allocates SKBuff structures for the segments and enqueues them to the socket right queue. As shown in figure three, TCP send message also guarantees adherence to the maximum segment size, MSS, after processing the queue, the kernel invokes TCP write queue tell. It also builds a TCP header and pushes the data from the user space into the SK buff. If the data fits into the existing buffer, SKB add data no cache is used. Otherwise, it creates new buffers, which is more expensive. It then sets the transport header pointer to the beginning of this header. Next, it builds a network layer protocol header as specified in the socket options. So here's your example, IPv4 for AF INET, TCP write, transmit, guarantees that the kernel holds back data in case of congestion control restrictions. It also sets retransmission timers, that is, resends a packet if it does not receive an ACK in time. Oh, good old TCP. Finally, the TCP transmit SKB reads the write queue containing previously constructed segments and passes them to the network layer via the queue transmit function specified in the socket. Let's see how UDP works. The function writes to the socket write queue, then the function waits until there is no pending frames for the UDP data gram. As before, the function builds a header, setting the destination port and other fill. There are corking and non-corking cases. Corking describes waiting for frames to patch multiple UDP datagrams. Non-corking implies building SKBuff directly. After constructing the datagram, IP route output flow routes the packet and builds a network layer protocol header. Lastly, IP append data creates an IP packet that combines multiple UDP datagram overall simplicity and absence of locking endorse that the UDP implementation is more performant than its TCP counterpart. I, I know it would have been ideal to stop at a more round number, but th that's it for this video, and the next one I'll go ahead and continue from here.